beneath the city. Just revitalized. Started riding with right. Fall is one of my favorite times of year to be an Oregonian. The leaves are turning, the nights are shorter, and the cooler weather is with us. There is nothing better in the Willamette Valley than fresh, locally grown produce in the fall. There are farm stands like this all over the valley. The one farm that is most famous out of all the farms in the Willamette Valley is Dietering Orchards. The Dieterings have a long history in the Willamette Valley. The family came here in 1911, didn't start the farm until about the 30s, and Roger Dietering passed away this last year, which brings some changes. But as you're going to see throughout this show tonight, which we're doing all from Dietering Farms, the changes are going to be good and it's going to continue to grow the operation. Food is a big deal in the Willamette Valley and it's becoming a bigger deal. Lane County Economic Development is now looking at food as a cluster. There's this undercurrent of food movement growing in this area, and what you're about to see will show you that food is coming back. It's big. Food has a lot of momentum here in Lane County. Really big. This is our next economy, and we, we believe that. Really, really big. In fact, it's the only industry sector that's grown since the Great Recession. Food and beverage manufacturing in Lane County, from the seed to the mill. Uh, we brought back a, a tradition that's been uh, missing for 80 years, a stone grist mill flour operation in Lane County. To the store and to your plate. Very exciting to see this come of, come of age. I mean, it's always been here, but so often it was processed and shipped away. Agriculture. We've got the fertile farmlands, we've got the farmers, we've got the producers, we've got the distributors. The original economy with a new twist. The prospects for food and beverage manufacturing in Lane County look good. We've got the land. Some of these projects, uh, the local food, are really rewarding when you're thinking of feeding your neighbors. We have the interest. Customers definitely notice it, and it's a draw. It's, a, it's really a draw for tourists. People, uh, the culinary tourism in this area is just growing like crazy. We have the expertise. There's a huge number of people in this, in this area who, some have started small and grown, and are now larger, but there's still this, you know, very vital, creative undercurrent of food. The craft beer industry is booming in Lane County. We started in 2006. We sold our first keg that summer. And it keeps growing. And as of 2011, we're the fastest growing brewery over five years in history, so it's been pretty rapid. History shows us it will work. So we've come back to the original purity and, and beauty of food grown here in this valley, so it's very exciting to have it available again. Agriculture. Lane County started this way. So you can produce the raw material, the food, and then there's infrastructure to process it and then get it out to the global market. Growing food, crops, creating markets. You really appreciate what we have here in terms of the access to all those things and the the access to producers and the access to high quality food and the access to high quality products that we have here. History has answers. Start small. We start locally with our Lane County businesses. We expand regionally and beyond. And then as that gets developed, it often uh, gets a market outside of the area and uh, can go national or global. Growing food. The key moving forward is linking them all together and moving forward in a cohesive manner. Creating jobs. There's an infrastructure built up from years and years of manufacturing. Growing new businesses. We've got everything that it takes. We've got the ingredients. Food, farming, future. We've got the, the fertile ground, we've got the water, we've got the climate, and we've got the desire. Collaboration is key in this industry and communication is key in this industry. We want to hear from the businesses. We want to hear from those folks in the food and beverage industry. What can we do to help you be successful?
I met Roger Dietering many years ago when I was a reporter at KVAL-TV. What I remember most is I did a package on him and I called Roger Bob. John Doyle, my boss at the time, was not happy. I got called into his office and he yelled at me and said, you do not call someone as famous as Roger Dietering Bob. Roger never let me forget it. Roger passed away this last year, but what's going on at Dietering Orchards not only shows what he was doing, but also shows what the family wants to continue to do with this place. Dietering Orchards near Coburg is more than a farm. Dietering Orchards is a way of life. My uh, great-grandparents, William and Julia, moved into the area back in 1911. The Dieterings want their way of life to become part of your life. In the 30s, the family grew row crops and rhubarb. Dietering's grandfather, a five-term state legislator in Oregon, had an idea to enhance the farm. Somewhere in the 40s, he decided he was going to grow peaches. And most of the farmers around here kind of laughed at him. But peaches caught on, and Dieterings was famous for growing what no one else could grow in the Willamette Valley. And at times, there would be rows of cars almost a mile out down the street back in the heavy canning days because people wanted to get peaches and there was nowhere else to get it. Roger and Sharon Dietering, Greg's parents, put apples and education into the farm mix. When they start with the gravin scenes, go into the cameo, the matsu, the king. Um, one of the everybody's favorite is the honey crisp. 36 varieties, some on the trees until December, available for sale most of the year. Roger wanted school kids to touch and feel and experience the farm. He pushed the high season from summer into the fall. You pick or pick it out yourself at the historic farm stand. You get to choose. But everyone walks away with the best produce in the valley and a better understanding of life on the farm. He had strong focus on education, really had a heart to educate the young people to understand nature and farming, where our food comes from. So he started doing a lot of field trips out here. Field trips are still a regular part of the experience at Dietering Orchards. Pumpkins and apples, row crops, corn so crisp the sound whispers as it's shucked. At Dietering Orchards, change is part of history and more is coming. The next generation of Dieterings is moving into agro-recreation. He uh, moved the, the farm into a whole another season we'd actually move, like to move it into a full year-round kind of operation. Dietering Orchards will still have all the fresh produce you count on, but enhanced with more activities and more ways to keep you entertained on the farm. Cider, we make cider out of every kind of apple. At Dietering Orchards, you get to be a part of the farm experience. It's all fresh. It's fresh, natural, there's nothing added to it. It's just literally just apples squeezed. I think my dad would be pretty surprised at uh, what we're doing, uh, but he would be happy about it. He would be happy that the next generation is bringing some other new ideas into the operation and enhancing it uh, to carry this on. That's, that's the thing he'd be happiest about, just to see that his life's work is being carried on into the next generations. At Dietering Orchards, you experience life in the country, life on the farm, and food gathering the way it's been done for generations. Dietering Orchards is not going away. Dietering Orchards is here to stay. We're going to shift gears drastically because this is a topic that's very important and it's October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's up to the community really to end the silence. The woman you're about to meet is ending the silence in her life. The people in this video are actors. They were hired, but the voice and the story is hers. My dear children, you were little when it began. 
It was supposed to be only temporary, just until we got on our feet. But he followed, making promises that I believed, promises that he could replace the dad that left you. The screaming and breaking our toys wouldn't last long. He would leave again. Imagine living in a home where, again, you're walking on eggshells. You don't know if one thing is going to make this abusive person just go off again. Um, imagine not coming home, you know, coming home and not knowing um, what that day is going to be like at home. Then when he returned, it was so much fun, playing in the park and roasting marshmallows in an old pail. Until next time, the anger from out of nowhere, tearing through the house, breaking the things we cared for most. There is an incident of abuse that is um, then followed by um, what is called the makeup period. That's also somewhat of a setup for what then follows what's called um, tension building. And this again is when you start to see that power and that control where the abusive partner um, will maybe start nitpicking, which is then again followed by another incident again. There's definitely no end and there's no beginning. It just, it's continuous. The things he did were horrible, some unspeakable. He abused me in ways most people have never even heard of. And you had to live with it. You never knew what you were coming home to. Every single day, the same thing. Would he be there that day or would he be gone? Would I be bloody and bruised? Eventually the questions in your mind became more serious. When we get home from school, will mama be alive? We had no friends and our world became very, very small. It basically cuts off the person from any resources, whether um, it would be, again, friends and family, um, whether it be places like women's space, it completely cuts them off. It makes them feel as though, though they're on an island and there's nobody there that, that, that can help. He assured me it wouldn't go on much longer, reminding me often that he would soon see me dead, and I believed him. It was always in my mind, will this be the day? I knew it couldn't go on forever. I knew he would kill me or the state would come and take you away from me. I didn't know which would happen first. Either way, I thought I would die. My dear children, I am sorry for the chaos and the fear that you had to live with. Intimate partner violence, um, the effects on children are, are pretty vast. Um, they are affected psychologically, emotionally, and even physiologically. Um, we see that a lot of children who have witnessed um, intimate partner violence um, will suffer in terms of their grades, um, will have a hard time maybe connecting with, 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 with other peers. Um, so in terms of making friends, that can be something that's really difficult. The day finally came. A horrible, awful day. People came and took you away. In these three years, I have come so far from where I was. I have a job now. I have a car and my first hand-me-down computer, and I get to live in a pretty apartment in a quiet neighborhood. I wish I could say I've fully recovered and that I am whole now. I have a long way to go. People heal 
in different ways and those time frames look really different for for everybody and that's why it's important that us as a community um, continue to do the work that we are doing um, because people will, will continually need to access our services and that is really, really important. There are good people, people we can trust. Son, I pray you will come to believe that. I am worthy of goodness, kindness, and compassion. Dear daughter, never settle for less than what you are worth. We must honor our convictions. We deal with this every single day, and women like this deserve to be supported. Women deserve to be believed, and that's what we're here to do. Okay, my promise to you is that I will do my best to take care of myself and to always provide you with a safe and loving place to call home. I love you with all my heart. Love, Mama. So this is Cindy Dixon. She's the person who's here who knows everything about produce and if you want to know which apple's the best eating or pie apple, you know. So pie. pie. I want my pie tart. Well, if you want it tart. You know tart. Yeah, if you want it tart, you go with Granny Smith. Okay. But right now, Granny Smith is still in the tree. So next best thing to Granny Smith would be a mutsu. And the mutsu, see the size of that apple? That yeah. way you don't have to core as much. But this is a great apple. But all of them make a good pie. It's just depending on how much sugar you want to put in the pie. Okay, so I wouldn't have to put as much with that. You would put a little bit more with this one, but not as much as a Granny Smith. To eat, just, just to snack on. I would choose one of them would be the John of Gold. I have to say I'm a little embarrassed with the size of our apples this year. <laughs> um, you know, they're a little bit on the small size, but these are called family size. But John of Gold is very sweet, very crisp, ready to eat. The Spartan fabulous apple. It's a little bit smaller, so the kids like it. Uh, the school district buy these from us. These are the empires. They buy them for the children. They're called, see the size of that? Yeah. They eat the whole apple. None left over. Ozark Gold, excellent for pies. Fuji, who doesn't like Fuji? These are the early Fuji, and we have a late Fuji as well. These are extremely sweet. You are the apple queen. I am. Thanks for yeah. letting us come out here and play today. Thanks for coming. In Cresswell, the community is looking at bringing a relief nursery to their town. They already send their children to Cottage Grove to the relief nursery. Now they're looking at an idea with the Cottage Grove Relief Nursery to expand that program. Take a look at this video and see how that would work. No te frotes, no te rasques. Oh no, cuantas más. Javier is not concerned with risk factors, opportunities, or his future potential right now. After all, he's only three. Y contento a la escuela voy hoy. But the Family Relief Nursery in Cottage Grove and Javier's family are aware, and they're doing something about it. We're in a program that is about prevention. It's about preventing what could be that could really stunt that potential and, and giving them the tools that they need to really just flourish as citizens, and we all gain by that. Javier, like many children from Crestwell, takes the bus to Cottage Grove several times a week to be part of the Family Relief Nursery Program. Risk factors may include things like domestic violence and substance abuse, mental illness. They may also include special education or special health needs. There, we assess 43 risk factors. The need for a relief nursery in Crestwell is growing. The city is excited about the idea and offering space as the anchor tenant in the future Cobalt Building. The Cresswell Relief Nursery would be a satellite of the Cottage Grove Nursery. Managing through Cottage Grove saves money and brings in much needed service to the Cresswell community. The city and the, the churches and the 
um, parent groups, all the school district, all of them have been very, very supportive. But it does take time to kind of build that necessarily financial support. And um, so it'll be a, a, a two or three year process. Javier is working on relating to his peers, learning English, and reducing potential risks by attending the nursery. I want him to be able to play with, well with other kids also to learn the language and also to learn more stuff. <laughs> the classes, the guidance, the support all matter to families that just need a little help. You know, we've been around for 18 years and what we've seen in those families is an incredible ability to reduce their risk within a very short time. <laughs> the Relief Nursery really can help change a community, one family at a time. It's an investment in early childhood education that pays off in the short and long term. I mean, we've served more than 1,300 kids here in 18 years, and that's just the kids that come here, not their families and their extended families. The potential, the ripple effect is amazing. For now, that's more information than Javier needs. He has books to read and games to play. We'll just knock on doors and go to parent meetings and um, make sure that there's awareness. But while he's learning English and how to relate to other kids, the nursery will be planning for his future and the future of other children in Cresswell. It will be very nice if we can have a relief nursery here. Because it's not just for me that will help my kid, but it will help another uh, people in the community. So if you have to pick a product at Dietering Orchards that they're famous for, you'd have to be their peaches. Or maybe it's, no, it's the apples. Or could be the pumpkins. In Cresswell, there's a coffee shop that's a lot like that. It's called Cresswell Coffee, but when you get inside, this is so much more than coffee. When marimba rhythms start to play, dance with me, make me sway. It was something we wanted to do for a long time. Other dancers may be on the floor. I mean, we were, for six years, trying to make plans in our life to own a coffee house. We were moving back to Oregon to be closer to family, and uh, Cresswell Coffee was for sale. It was, the price is right. We really want it to be a good place for the local community to come hang out and just be very comfortable for people kind of like a, almost as a living room atmosphere kind of place. Um, we're really, really into the live music. It's a music venue. It is a coffee house, it's a cafe, a bistro. Well, and it's a community center. musicians, <laughs> even like local musicians, have really come to know this place as a place they want to play. Yeah. And they really, I mean, they come out of everywhere and ask if they can come play here because they've heard such good things about it. Sweet dreams till sun gives you. Haley always brings a crowd. Sweet dreams that no worries behind you. To have a place where we can provide such a spectrum of music, I mean, everything from uh, a full-out five-person rock band to a solo um, classical guitarist and everything in between. Uh, it's just neat. I, I love Friday and Saturday nights. They're a blast. We have a, an employee um, affectionately known as the CCC Soup Lady on Twitter. <laughs> We have about 40, maybe 45 soups that we kind of cycle through. Um, every Tuesday, her and I sit down together and come up with a menu for the week. Uh, we go get the fresh produce uh, that we need. Some of it's out of our garden, some of it's from the local farmer's market, and, and start making soups. And as much as I say that we're a coffee house, I would say the bulk of my business is selling food. Um, I mean, we, on a busy day, like, like a Tuesday, I mean, we can go through three crocks of soup in an afternoon. And it's not just soups, it's all the salads and mm, that's true, and yeah. that too. That, homemade um, paninis, homemade salads. It would probably have about 25 salad recipes as well to add to that. The homemade soups, the homemade salads, 
the atmosphere, comfortable seating, um, great, great music, all those come into place to allow people to enjoy themselves here. What people realize once they've been here, we're really not that far from Eugene. I mean, 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe. It's kind of become like a little escape for some people. Okay, Brooke, thanks for inviting us out here today. So tell people when you guys are open so they know when to come out. We're open every single day, Monday through Saturday, um, 8 to 6, and UPIC closes at 5, and then on Sundays we're open until 5, and UPIC closes at 4. And through December? Through December, um, and then probably into January, February, maybe even March, depending on how long we have apples. Okay, do you think you and I can go get an apple? I want the best yes. one, okay? I I'm going to give you a Matsu. Okay, let's go, let's go go to Sue. <laughs> to say I am the proudest and uh, happiest guy around right now. Our, our little baby is absolutely gorgeous. Healthy, eight pound, one ounce bottle of joy. I can't explain, I just need to do things my own way. If your child has any eight of the 16 behaviors or symptoms listed here. He or she most likely has autism, and Maria easily had 13. And I could feel my heart sink at that moment, because I wasn't really sure, you know, what that meant. We, we said, why, why us, as well as what did we do? Men, we like to fix things, you know? Tell me what's wrong, here's what we'll do, we'll fix this, but, uh, I couldn't fix this. As soon as you hear your child has autism, it's really hard to listen to anything that comes after. And early on, gosh, when, when you don't know what they need and you don't know what they're thinking, it, those are really frustrating times because you, you want to be able to help and you, you can't. You don't know how. What's our, what's our role in this? What are we going you know, to do? It's such a helpless feeling. He's not, you know, he's not communicating. I didn't know what to expect. I said, okay, what do we do next? What are we going to do to help Sam? This is bigger than me. It's uh, what I should want to do. It's an opportunity rather than some kind of burden. And which of us is brave enough to throw away our fears? Father that's not going to give up on his son. The times definitely do get much better. I just seen a lot of friends uh, run themselves ragged trying to figure out autism when, when in all reality you only have to figure out one child. This is my challenge and I'll try to meet it but nobody goes their whole life undefeated. People talk about a mother's love and so forth and it's real but dad's love too. Dads love big.